Chapter 28. Onwards and upwards. I quickly adjusted to being the biggest star in the company, the guy with the heaviest load and the biggest pay. I got a $55,000 check for SummerSlam 1992, and my paychecks tripled to around $6,000 to $7,000 a week. I finally believed that I'd one day be able to pay my house off, and took down the for sale sign for good. One of the first wrestlers I called after I won was Roddy. I'd already said to Owen that I was relying on him to help me watch my back, because as much as the wrestlers all said they were happy for me, everybody wanted my spot. Roddy echoed those words, stressing how important it was for me to get close to Vince, to try to be his best friend. I'd already been told by Pat that Vince liked to hear from his champion every day, so I was calling Vince daily even though to me it just felt like brown nosing. On October 27th, at TV's in Terre Haute, Indiana, Vince and Pat told Davey it was time for him to drop the IC belt to Sean. Instead of reminding Davey that dropping the belt to Sean was part of the plan all along, Pat explained that they could only push one babyface champion at a time, and I was it. This sowed seeds of discontent in Davey. Meanwhile, I did my best to be a friend to him, reminding him not to take it personally. But Davey grumbled long and loud about leaving to go back to Japan or WCW. Over-the-top gimmicks had been the fad for some time in the WWF. Vince's newest creation was an evil clown he called Doink, to be worked by Matt Bourne. In fairness to him, I have to admit that Matt had an uncanny ability to be a creepy clown, Doink had potential. But when Vince shot an angle having Davey lose to Doink, Davey misread the opportunity. Instead of realizing that working a program with a hot new heel would be good for him, he chose to listen to Diana, who was increasingly calling the shots and who convinced Davey that he was above jobbing out for a stupid clown. As Vince's new champion, I was counted on to fill Hulk's shoes. Being a successful world champion requires more than just being the best worker, and in fact, sometimes the best world champions aren't the best workers, Hogan and Warrior being the prime examples. Although I had a massive grassroots following, I didn't have the level of promo skills or charisma of Hogan. I wasn't six foot eight with 24 inch arms. Strangely, it worked to my advantage. My athletic physique was as realistic as my wrestling, hence, in the midst of the steroid scandal, was doing his best to turn his business around based on my believability. If anything, I was the perfect contrast to Hogan, especially for fans who were sick of his all too familiar act. I was recognized for being an artist and a storyteller. If Hogan was the Elvis of wrestling, I was the Robert De Niro. Vince needed me to steer clear of any and all trouble, and he was counting on the fact that I could work a four-star match with almost anyone. The days when the WWF was stocked with the best lineup of heels in the business to get Hogan and Warrior over were gone. Now almost all of the great heels that Vince had invested so much TV time in had disappeared from the WWF under the harsh light of the steroid scandal, and some were now riding high in WCW. Soon enough, I was launched on return bouts with Flair, who seemed bent on sabotaging our matches. I wasn't sure whether he was doing it accidentally or on purpose, but he was never there for me on my comeback and seemed to bungle the finish every night. I began to refer to Rick's ring style as full blast, non-stop non-psychology. He made things up on the spot and did them whether they made sense or not. As a technician Flair was one of the best, but I was baffled by how little he really knew about building a great match. And I was even more baffled by how this went undetected by fans and sheet writers, who continued to worship him. On November 18th, Vince phoned to tell me he'd just fired Warrior and that, unfortunately, Davey was going to be next. He wanted to tell me first so I could prepare for any backlash that might happen as a result. He said that Warrior and Davey had been receiving shipments of growth hormone from a dealer in the UK who'd just been busted. Vince was so under the gun that he fired them both immediately. The fanciful vision I'd had of me twisting Warrior into the sharpshooter and him screaming uncle at WrestleMania 9 vanished forever. After so many wrestlers had lain down to make him a star, Warrior would never return the favor. As for Davey, he was out of work and trying to get on with WCW. Taker and I knew we were being heavily relied on to be the new leaders. Vince also pinned his hopes on Sean, who was beginning to blossom into an obnoxious pretty boy hill who took great bumps, comparable only to Perfect or Dynamite. He was a tag team wrestler finally finding his niche as a singles performer. I fondly remember Sean praising me the night I won the belt and telling me how grateful he was that I had finally opened the door for the smaller yet better workers who never got a break. Guys like us. He smiled and slapped me on the back. Vince was building six foot seven Scott Hall as a takeoff on Al Pacino's Scarface character. He cut promos with an obviously put on Cuban accent and a toothpick dangling from his lip until he flicked it away. His neck was adorned with fake gold chains and a tacky razor medallion, his unshaven face was framed by long, 
greasy black hair and one casual curl carefully positioned to hang right down the middle of his forehead. Hall was well built but still green. On Kurt's suggestion he was dubbed Razor Ramon. Since Vince was dangerously low on heels, Razor was mega pushed to the top and set to work with me in January at Royal Rumble 1993. Another potential top hill was Yokozuna, a huge Samoan named Rodney on Hawaii, whom Vince billed as a legit sumo wrestler and passed off as Japanese. Mr. Fuji was his manager. Last but not least was the beast from the east, Bam Bam Bigelow, with his tattooed head. He departed a while back only to reappear with a much improved attitude. He couldn't have come at a better time. I desperately hoped Vince could build some of these heels for me as soon as possible. On November 25th, after a long match at Survivor Series in Richfield, Ohio, I caught Shawn Michaels by the ankles, as he was coming off the top rope, with a flying drop kick and put him into the sharpshooter to retain the world title at my first pay-per-view as champion. Shawn confessed to me that he wasn't in working shape to go a long match, so I paced the match a lot slower than I would have liked, as a favor to him. Vince said the match was right on the money, which was all I needed to know. In Montreal, in early December, Pat brought me and Rick together, and diplomatically told Flair to start trying harder. Rick was as obliging as ever before we got into the ring, but the match turned out exactly the same, maybe this was just how he worked. Then Rick apologized to me for our matches not being better, explaining that he was simply burned out and was dealing with family problems. I wanted to believe him, so I did. He would be leaving soon, anyway. On December 14th at Green Bay TV's, Vince pumped my hand and slapped me on the back as he closed his office door. Then he said, I thought you should know Hogan's coming back. But he'll have nothing to do with my plans for you and the belt. He'll only be working tags with Beefcake for a short time as a favor, to help promote a movie he's got coming out. I pictured Hulk shaking his head, with a big grin on his face, maybe a little relieved that the belt was on me instead of Warrior, or worse. I thought he'd be glad to see it on someone who at least worked hard for it. Someone who respected and protected the business. I still had such respect for Hogan that if Vince had asked me to step back and hand him the belt, it would have been fine by me. Vince had his problems to deal with in Green Bay. For the past six months, he had been building Kevin Wakehalls as a psycho killer ex-con named Nails. Kevin cornered Vince in his office and screamed at him for 15 minutes about all the lies he'd been told. His yelling got so loud I had goosebumps up my back as I listened from down the hall. Suddenly there was a loud crash. Nails had knocked Vince over in his chair, choking him violently, until Lanza, Slaughter and a swarm of agents teamed up to pull him off. Nails walked out and immediately called the police and accused Vince of making a sexual advance to him. Vince was charged with sexual assault, the charges were dropped shortly thereafter. Some of the boys actually admired Nails for snatching Vince, and then covering his tracks well enough not to get charged himself. The last thing Vince wanted was yet another scandal. The FBI was about to indict him for receiving steroids through the mail from the convicted doctor. The WBF was sinking fast and his wrestling empire was on shaky legs too. I wanted to come through for him only days earlier he'd said to me that he hadn't always done right by his wrestlers but that starting with me he was going to change all that. On my Christmas break, Julie and I celebrated what had to be the best year of my life. It appeared that we might actually succeed after all the house, the kids, the dream. It all looked so nice through my rose-colored glasses, but there I was leaving on Christmas Day again. When my bags were packed and set by the door later that night, Blake came down in his pajamas and said, Can I come to the port, Dad? Boy I'd sure miss him. He was already two and a half. I picked him up and said, You can come if you promise me that you won't cry when I leave. He nodded and scampered away to put on his winter boots. It was midnight when Julie and Blade dropped me off. We had a long hug and then a few short tight ones and a few good kisses. Blade said he wouldn't cry, and he didn't. I took my seat up in first class next to Owen, who had been upgraded for the flight, and who wore the same heartbroken expression as I did. In a few hours we'd be sleeping on the airport floor in Toronto, with our bags for pillows, waiting to connect to another flight to work back-to-back -back double shots. TVs were now every third Monday and Tuesday. On the other Mondays of the month Vince added a show called Monday Night Raw, which would alternate between live and taped matches. The concept for Monday Night Raw was that it would be at the same venue each week, a historic 3,500-seat theater within walking distance of Madison Square Garden called the Manhattan Center. In January 1993 alone the WWF produced something like 14 hours of TV and a major pay-per-view. For the shows that didn't air live, commentary was overdubbed in a number of languages at the WWF's slick in-house production facility in Connecticut and beamed via satellite to networks worldwide. That's not to mention the 42 towns run that month with two teams of wrestlers for the house shows. 
this schedule became normal. They published it for fans in the monthly WWF magazine under the banner Killer Calendar and that's what it was. On January 9, 1993, I had to do another return match with Flair at the Boston Garden, billed as a one-hour marathon match, it was the first show of a weekend of back-to-back -back double shots. I'd come up with a good finish that I ran by Vince, but when I told Flair he began telling me what we were going to do instead. I finally cut him off and, with regret, dressed him down in front of several wrestlers. Rick, I'm the champion and this is how it's going to go. He dropped his jaw, turned red and sat on a bench saying, you're the champ. Rick still managed to mess up the timing for every fall. I was furious when Dave Meltzer wrote in the Wrestling Observer that Flair had carried me for the whole match when it was, in fact, the other way around. There were some interesting moments at Royal Rumble later that month in Sacramento. Lex Luger was a former WCW wrestler whom Vince brought into his World Bodybuilding Federation, and then lured to the WWF by promising him the moon. It wasn't working out so well. Luger was now called the narcissist and, before every match had to pose in front of a full-length mirror in the middle of the ring, tassels hanging from his white trunks. Although he was in fabulous shape and he was steroid-free, he looked small in the ring. To the fans his new, conceited persona was as uninteresting as the faltering WBF. During Lex's routine streams of people headed to the concession stands. That night Sean was defending the IC belt against Marty Jannetty, who showed up drunk and unkempt from an all-nighter. Wasted Marty fumbled and stumbled his way through the match, but, much to his credit, the fans never noticed. Vince fired him as soon as he got out of the ring. A new arrival to WWF was Memphis promoter and wrestler Jerry the King Lawler. He was Honky Tonk's second cousin and had a similar build, soft and pudgy, with not a muscle on him. Lawler had a lot of heat with various wrestlers who'd worked for him over the years, get even, several of them took the time to shit in his crown and left it for him to find in the showers. I was glad to see former WWF world champion Bob Backlund return for the Battle Royal. I'd never forgotten how, when I was in Japan in the early 1980s, he bought beer for all the boys on the bus. The Mark and me got off watching Flair and Backlund, two very different legends from the old school, working in the Rumble. Bob was as clean-cut as they came, whereas Flair loved to walk on the wild side. They were two of the longest reigning champions of my era, from two different territories. It was hard for anyone to complain about who they were working with after watching poor Undertaker carry Giant Gonzalez, a 7'6", very affal Argentinian who couldn't work at all. He was so skinny they couldn't put him in trunks, instead he had to wear a ridiculous-looking flesh-colored unitard with muscles airbrushed all over it. As for my match with Razor Ramon, he was still so green I called everything. I was afraid that Scott could break my neck with his finish, the razor's edge, a move where he'd press you up by the armpits and then fall forward, dropping you right on your neck. Instead I came up with a clever way to get out of it by dropping behind him and backsliding him for a pinfall. It turned out to be an up and down fight until I came up with the sharpshooter out of nowhere and he submitted. When I was handed the belt I saw Stu and Helen standing in the front row clapping, and Yoko had won the rumble, so now he'd be the heel to face me at WrestleMania 9 in Las Vegas in early April. At the hotel, someone pointed out to me that Dave Meltzer was lurking about in the lobby, reluctant to come into the bar. Eventually, my mom introduced me to him. Meltzer was very polite and a bit nervous as I glared at him. I whispered to her afterwards, he's no friend of mine, mom. On January 26th, I flew out to Las Vegas with Vince, Pat and all the top boys to kick off the hype for WrestleMania 9 with a huge press conference. Afterwards, Vince and Pat said that I had come across as humble and that was exactly what they were looking for to help project a wholesome image now that it was almost certain Vince would be indicted by the feds. I managed to get home for one day before dashing off to Madison Square Garden, and was saddened to hear that Andre had died. He'd flown to France for his father's funeral only to be found dead in his hotel room the morning after. I pictured him walking through the pearly gates with a big smile on his face, for once not having to duck, saying, Hello, boss there would never be another giant like Andre. The last time I'd been in Europe I wouldn't have believed it possible that I'd be returning as world champion. On February 1st, I arrived in Manchester, and Nobbs rang my room to tell me that he'd tracked down Dynamite. He'd phoned him to say he was coming over and invited me and Chief to go along with him as a surprise. Tom and the Nasty Boys had toured together in Japan a few years back. Nobbs and Sags had been charmed enough by him to allow him to use the tops of their heads as ashtrays while they rode the bus. We found Tom's flat in a miserable, graffiti-stained ghetto on the outskirts of the city. The windows were boarded up and the charred remains of a car were smoldering out front. He answered the door in a t-shirt and blue jeans looking James Dean normal, with a V-shaped physique. It was the first time I'd seen him steroid-free since I'd known him. 
Fuka niggers did it, he said, pointing at the car as he invited us in. Tom took a seat on a shredded old couch, moving slowly as he eased his way into it, smoking a cigarette. He rudely referred to his girlfriend Joanne, as a daft stupid cunt enough times that it embarrassed everyone except him, and she looked shell-shocked by his behavior. Chief's face gave away his disappointment and disgust. When Nobbs innocently blurted out that I was the champ, Tom nodded and replied to Intercontinental, right? No, Dino, he's the world champion now. He's got the big belt. When I won the world championship, I recall thinking, I'd love to see the look on Dynamite's face when he finds out. I got to see it now. His first expression was one of disbelief and shock. Then, for only a moment, he seemed happy, like it confirmed his own greatness in some way. No sooner had I begun to see that he was maybe even proud of me, than his face turned sour, his look said, this is what things could have been like for me if I hadn't become so broken broken. Then, briefly, optimism seemed to wash over him, maybe somehow I could help him. But as the thought formed, he lifted his chin indignant, his pride hurt, he didn't want anything from me or anyone else. While we were there, people drove by and threw things at his house, which, he explained, is why the windows were all boarded up. Tom was finding out that there was a heavy price for his bigotry. He still had a real sore spot about Davy, and for that I couldn't totally blame him. Davy had trademarked the British Bulldog name before Tom or even Vince, and now he refused to let Tom, the original British Bulldog, use his own ring name to make a living. In the car on the way back to the hotel, Chief said he regretted that we'd gone to see him. Dynamite was one of his favorites, and now his memories would be forever ruined. Tom showed up at the hotel that night. He thought things over a bit and was now blown away by my position and desperate for any kind of a lifeline for me. I'd already been talking to Chief and Vince about trying to do something for him. But when I told Tom, he shook his head. Nah, I'll never go back. I left him in the bar with knobs and sags, where he was soon crying in his beer. All our hearts went out to him. Dynamite was hard to love, but we did, and it was heartbreaking to see the best worker I ever knew finally reveal his inner agony at the mistakes he'd made, and how things had ended up for him. After the show on February 6th, we all drank at Cookies, a rock and roll bar in Frankfurt that was always packed with Fräulein. I somehow ended up in Bammer's room with two large German girls, and by 5 a.m. I was suplexing and Russian leg sweeping one of them on the giant bed. I like to think of it as training for my mania match with Yokozuna. Then Bam Bam elected to pick the bigger one up over his back and give her a Samoan drop onto the bed. There was a loud crack as the bed frame broke, all we could do was laugh as he sat on his ass with the bed collapsed all around him. Bammer had been through a lot of ups and downs, but he had a great attitude now. We'd been working almost every night having fantastic matches. After the final show of the tour, we busted to Dusseldorf, and would head home in the morning. That night taker, Papa and I said farewell to Flair in the bar, it being his last day, before he'd go back to WCW. After our last match, in Dortmund, Rick had clasped my hand and said, My friend, you are truly a great worker. I decided that Vince was right when he said that Flair wasn't ruining our matches on purpose. He was just from a different era, when all the spots were called in the ring, and he was the one calling them. Later that night, seeing that Flair's door was open, I knocked, and he invited me in, waving me to sit down while he finished a phone call with some bigwig from WCW. Rick spoke highly of me and my work and described my popularity in Europe as being like Elvis. He also said some kind words about Taker. The way Rick put us all over just might come in handy one day. On February 18th, I heard that Kerry Von Erich had committed suicide, shot himself in the heart. Left a note that said he was joining his brothers in heaven. Owen and I were deeply saddened, but who? Could be surprised? As the son of a wrestling promoter, Kerry never found it easy living up to the hopes and expectations put before him. I've always thought that despite the closeness of the Von Erich boys, they were still so competitive that they thought topping one another with this final exit was the ultimate act of bravado. I remembered my mom telling me about the first Von Erich son who died. Little Jackie Jr. had played with Smith and Bruce back in the late 1950s when Fritz worked for Stu under his born name, Jack Atkinson. A few weeks later, the Atkinsons were living in Buffalo, where Fritz was wrestling, and Jackie was electrocuted by a power line at a trailer park. I also couldn't forget that cold day in February 1984, when Dynamite, Davy and I were working over in Japan and heard that Carrie's older brother, David, who was in Japan working for Baba's promotion, had just died of a drug overdose. The same thing took Mike Von Erich on April 12, 1987. He was high when he zipped himself inside a sleeping bag that he filled with rocks and rolled himself out of a small boat and drowned. And the youngest brother, Chris, had shot himself on September 12, 1991. 
I just wish there had been something I could have done to help Carrie. We all did. On February 22nd, Owen and I flew to Texas for Carrie's funeral, held in the local Baptist church. Fritz and Doris had recently divorced, but they put on a unified front, stoic in their acceptance. Of their six sons, only Kevin remained. I could see that it meant a lot to Fritz that two of Stu's boys were there. When they lowered Carrie's casket into the earth, I couldn't help but think, we'll see you at the gates, brother. When I read my booking sheets, I realized I'd see Hulk at TVs in North Charleston, South Carolina, on March 8th. Even though he'd been making the odd appearance on various shows since December, I hadn't laid eyes on him since WrestleMania 8, when I'd given him his drawing. I really thought he'd be proud of me, so when I pulled up to the back of the arena, I went looking for him. I didn't have to look far. He was standing chatting with Beefcake, leaning against the wall on the ramp. His appearance had changed drastically. He looked like a lean old walrus. He was tanned and wore red spandex tights, big white boots and a bandana covering his balding head. I approached with a huge smile and my hand extended in friendship. Hogan gave me a dismissive nod and wouldn't shake my hand. I withdrew it and walked away. I figured that because I was champion now he saw me as the competition. Hulkamania had run so wild that it had burned itself out like a grass fire, and here I was, one of the new brightly colored flowers popping up to haunt him. The day only got worse. Owen was getting a push, working with Bam Bam. While springing up to the top rope for a back somersault, he slipped coming down and tore a ligament in his knee injuring himself so badly that instead of being given a push, he was pulled out of the ring and taken to the hospital. He was expected to be out for a long time. The only positive thing that happened was that I managed to talk Yoko into lying on the dressing room floor where, much to his surprise, I crouched down atop his twisted thick calves and was actually able to put on the sharpshooter. I didn't picture beating him with it, but none of the fans would think it would be possible for me to turn him over, the move had the potential to be a great spot for WrestleMania 9. Vince was having him destroy all his opponents, and I was shaping up to be a huge underdog. Wrestlers' deaths continued to come in threes. After Andre and Kerry, the boys openly wondered who'd be next. It was Dino Bravo, only 44 years old. On March 10, Dino was found dead in his home near Montreal. He'd been shot 17 times, so that the precise shots formed a circle in the back of his skull, Rumor was that he had double-crossed the mafia in the trafficking of contraband cigarettes. A nervous Dino had recently confided to close friends that his days were numbered. On April 2, 1993, I brought Stu and Helen with